thank you very much. Um, this paper uh, draws on a lot of the same ideas that the course paper draws on, and it touches on a lot of the same things, but it looks at it from a somewhat different point of view. Uh, because what we're interested in looking at in this paper is sort of the causal mechanisms behind perceptions of politicians. Um, the uh, tone of the paper has changed somewhat since the paper um, was printed, but the basic um, emphasis of the paper is the same. So uh, this uh, paper is sort of the, the summary of a book, um, which is uh, being, coming out. Um, it's going to be coming out next year. Um, and so what I've done is from kind of summarizing my work in terms of I've, I've selected uh, a few strands from this that I think uh, might be particularly relevant to what we're discussing today. Um, basically, we were, we were interested in the idea of um, what people think of the political ethics, what they think of the integrity of, of their political leaders, their elected representatives. Um, and I thought like this as a comparativist from the perspective of having studied lots of countries in the world that are far more corrupt objectively than the UK, Azerbaijan or Ukraine or Bulgaria, places where they have really serious problems of corruption. And I have always been struck by the fact that it's strange that people in Britain say that politicians are so corrupt when they're not, um, or at least most of the evidence that we have, the objective evidence, and as much as we have that objective evidence, suggests that British politicians really aren't that corrupt. So why is it that people think they're so awful? And so that's the sort of the, the puzzle that motivated this project. And um, we uh, approached the project um, from the um, basic point of view of the gap that we've identified, or um, showed to between citizens' aspirations for how their politicians should behave and then how their perceptions of how politicians do behave. So that was the basic starting point. We noted that there was a big gap, which yeah, any taxi driver can tell you, but that was uh, the first component of the argument. And the, the, the second component of the argument, which is sort of the one that we think is probably uh, the core of, of our argument in, in the analysis we've done, is that one of the reasons for this gap, and there are a number of reasons. Well, one of the reasons for this gap that hasn't really been brought out by previous analyses so much is that when you ask ordinary members of the public to evaluate the ethics of the political leaders, they do that using quite different criteria from the criteria that um, political scientists tend to think about, or politicians themselves tend to think about when they evaluate ethics. And that is something I'm going to be I'm talking about in um, a bit more detail. Uh, and then the final component of the argument that I won't be going into so much detail on is that in integrity of perceptions matter uh, for political processes, uh, including, as Paul mentioned, they matter for vote choice, also matter as we found for participation, willingness to obey the law, susceptibility to political leadership, and a wide variety of different aspects of the political, pro political process. Um, right, so um, the nuts and bolts of this. Uh, analysis, uh, the uh, <coughs> study on which this paper was based was a study that was carried out between 2008 and 2010, going into 2011 a little bit, and the core of the analysis um, was a three-wave um, uh, panel survey, at least it was part of the British Cooperative Campaign Analysis Project, which is a large panel survey which you can sort of buy into, and you bought into three of the, of the waves of that. It's a survey that was um, run by Ray Dutch at Oxford and fielded by YouGov, who are very generous in their support for us and help. Um, and we bought into a wave that uh, took place in the spring of 2009, just before the Olympic expense scandal. This wasn't planned, we didn't know it was going to happen, it was very useful. Uh, and then we built another wave in autumn 2009, right around the time of the party conferences after the, the scandal, and then uh, another way than the, the run up to the general election. Um, in addition to the uh, survey data, we also uh, fielded a number of focus groups in um, 2009-2010. We weren't originally planning on doing focus groups, uh, but somebody convinced us that this would be a good idea, not least to test our survey questions, uh, and they proved to be incredibly useful. Because when we went into the focus group, we started by very general questions, asking people, well, what do you think 
love your political leaders. And what do you think of their ethics? What do you think? Do you think they're moral or not? Why do you think they're moral? Why don't you think they're moral? Do you think they're, you know, what, what, what are your problems you have with them? And we were, we were thinking about things like conflict of interest and, and you know, uh, cash for questions, that type of thing. And um, we were struck by the fact that our focus group participants said things like, well, they don't keep their campaign promises, or they spin, or in one of the cases, the focus groups we um, held at, um, in Bradford said, well, they, they let in so many immigrants, um, and this is really immoral, or, or they, you know, they don't give straight answers to questions, and they're speaking on television, and so they're, they're a bit devious, and, and you know, they don't, they don't stick to, to, to their, their manifesto commitments. And we said, no, 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 don't, don't, we're, don't, we're not interested in this sort of policy stuff, or sort of, you know, how they, how, how they answer German taxpayer and whatever. We want to talk about, you know, integrity issues. We want to talk about conflict of interest and stuff. And then it finally dawned on us that, no, actually, this is what they see as integrity issues. This is what ordinary people understand when you ask them um, about uh, the benefits. Uh, and that then developed into one of the core components of our analysis that ordinary people have a much broader understanding of what constitutes ethical behavior than um, most members of parliament themselves, which we also drew on some, uh, some early uh, survey data, and, 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 and indeed political scientists and a lot of political commentators who tend to see political ethics in a very narrow conflict of interest framework, because that's the framework that's dominated um, the institutional development of, of the, ethics re the ethics regimes uh, in the UK for um, at least uh, the 20th century and the 21st century, or reform measures, successive reform measures, have been designed to prevent politicians from abusing uh, their position in order to uh, gain resources for themselves. But what we found was, in addition to the abuse of power uh, in order to benefit um, parties and individuals in, in financial you know, terms, we found that. Our focus group participants, and subsequently implanted, also as concerned by our survey data, were just as concerned about the use of words, sort of discursive integrity, just as concerned about that as they were about the use of um, uh, resources. And that um, developed into one of the core components of our uh, analysis, and we think that that is one of the reasons why people are so concerned about political ethics in the UK, and one of the reasons why there's this discrepancy between what MPs and politicians and political elite think and what ordinary people think. And also one of the, it helps to explain the puzzle is why is it that the UK is so much less corrupt than Azerbaijan, but people think that politicians are so corrupt. Um, okay, we also um, deployed some arguments from political psychology, and we looked at some of the um, political psychology literature and we found that there were two things that helped us to uh, go further in explaining the, the sort of causal mechanism behind perceptions of uh, political integrity. And these are drawn from um, Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky's work um, on uh, biases in, in evaluations. And, there was one tendency that we found was, was actually quite useful, and that's what they refer to as availability, which is the tendency to make generalizations about the frequency of passive events for information that comes immediately to mind. And so um, Paul was talking about media malaise. I mean, the, the media often reports on allegations of impropriety. The media doesn't report on politicians doing good things and being honest. <coughs> and so when people think of politicians, what's immediately going to come to mind what's available in their minds when politicians are mentioned to them, when they discuss politicians, what's available in their minds are these allegations of imp impropriety. And so one of the other components of our, our argument is that the discussion of politicians in the media, the way politicians are framed in the media, makes these negative evaluations immediately available to people. Um, and as our Showed, I mean, we didn't actually find the, the same um, specific media malaise uh, 
the empirical findings that, that Paul did, perhaps because we didn't have so many survey responses, we didn't have such a long period of time, and others, we didn't find that people read the newspaper more were more critical of politicians. It, it appeared more to be a sort of a general um, impact of the way uh, political activities are framed in the media that made people predisposed to thinking of politicians uh, in a negative light. And the other um, uh, sort of evaluative um, uh, tool that we, we found quite useful in explaining people's attitudes towards politicians was what Conor and Tversky referred to as adjustment, adjustment and anchoring. And this is the tendency to start from an anchor point, which usually is rooted in personal experience, um, and then to relate, uh, to, to adjust somewhat but generally insufficiently in the, the direction of the anticipated variation. So uh, basically, we found, and, and this again came out very much in, in our focus groups and also is reflected in the survey data, uh, that people, when they're evaluating politicians, they start from their own personal experiences. And they say, well, if I feel my expenses in my workplace, that would be taken very seriously. I'd probably lose my job. I certainly you know, would face some quite serious fines. Or if I you know, give a whole lot of examples of things that they might do, that they would be very heavily sanctioned. If I don't, you know, get my, my fill in my forms right and keep my financial affairs in order, and I, you know, the Indian Revenue is going to really get after me. How is it that these politicians seem to be above the law? How is it they manage to get away with these things? Um, and if you think about what most the, the lives that most people lead, most people have jobs that. Uh, where, where they have uh, quite a lot of uh, regulatory regimes that control what they do on a, a, a daily basis. But most people have jobs where they don't have a huge amount of autonomy. Most people have jobs with relatively moderate salary. At the point when we were fielding our surveys, the um, average uh, income for someone who's working full time was about £26,000 a year. So when you think about the anchor points that most people have, um, and they compare themselves to MPs who have jobs that have a relatively large amount of autonomy, relatively high level of salaries, quite complex lives that um, parliamentarians lead. You can see how people, a lot of people would think that the, the, the types of things that MPs um, engage in are somehow um, dubious by virtue of the fact that they're dealing with larger sums of money, by virtue of the fact that they're you know, submitting expensive claims without receipts and that type of things. It does do have another walks of life, but probably not the walks of life that most people are familiar with. And so, um, in addition to the, sort of the, the fact that people uh, evaluate discursive honesty and give that the same weight as they do uh, financial honesty, in addition to that, we also uh, drew on these uh, psychological um, insights to try to understand the causal mechanism. How is it, is it that people go about evaluating uh, the uh, representatives and why is it that they uh, they, they come to such negative conclusions about them. Okay, um, these are some, I'm, I haven't, I'm not going to go into all the gory details of the rubbish analysis, those are uh, available. Um, but, uh, I decided to just, uh, for the purposes of this presentation, should just stick with uh, a few basic graphs. These um, are the overall perceptions of honesty and integrity from our data at three different points of time. Um, interestingly, we found that the expenses scandal didn't seem to have a hugely negative impact on what people thought of their politicians. Um, indeed, perceptions um, of uh, people, uh, politicians being uh, more or less honest actually rose a bit um, after the expenses scandal, possibly as the result of the reforms that were put in place. Uh, possibly at the time of the general election, because general elections generally kind of boost people's evaluation of politicians and politicians out there campaigning and you know, interacting with people and so forth. Um, and we have interpreted this in terms of the fact that people probably had very low evaluations of politicians at the outset of the scandal, uh, and the scandal <coughs> was uh, lower than those evaluations too much, uh, so that they already had to work out low to, to start with. Um, but as you can see here, it's quite clear that most people don't think very much of um, their elected politicians, the mode of category, and see that they think that overall honesty and integrity uh, are, is somewhat low, and a lot of people think it's very low. Um, 
Now, the correlates, so this is sort of the summary of the, the regression analysis we did, the correlates of, uh, the most important correlates of perceptions of uh, politicians' honesty and integrity are firstly, people's low normative standards, um, their own personal standards, their expectations of politicians. Um, if people don't think politicians really need to be that honest, if they don't think it's that important for politicians to be honest, then they're going to be less critical of them. Right? Also, if they have dubious personal ethics, so if they think it's kind of okay to get on the bus and not pay the fare, or it's okay to try to get <coughs> uh, in place in their personal lives, they're also going to be more um, tolerant of dubious political shenanigans. So um, if people sort of have somewhat lax in their normative standards and their personal integrity, they're also going to be less critical of politicians. And conversely, obviously, if they have high uh, expectations of politicians and they have high levels of personal integrity, they're going to be more critical of politicians. Um, and partisanship is, is the other thing that we found to be important. Uh, people are supporters of the major political parties, they're uh, less critical of politicians, although it's unclear exactly what the direction of causality uh, it could be that if people are, are less critical of politicians, they're going to be more available um, for mobilization by political parties and more willing to support political parties. Um, interestingly, in, in, in um, some other analysis of, um, of the, uh, what people think of uh, various things that politicians get up to, specific to vignettes that we feel that um, and uh, expose people to, we found that. Um, among both the political elite and among the ordinary members of the public, that um, conservative party identifiers and conservative um, MPs and candidates uh, for parliament were uh, more tolerant of, of things that uh, many people consider ethically dubious behaviour than um, mm -hmm. partisans of, of other political parties. And that was a somewhat an unexpected finding, something that we haven't yet explained. Uh, my collaborator and I come from opposite ends of the political spectrum, so this wasn't sort of a, a party political finding it anyway. We were both somewhat surprised by it, but that was something that came out actually in several of these different analyses that, that we did. That um, Tories were sort of uh, a bit more tolerant of, of the types of things that other people were to criticise. Um, we, we actually struggled to find any media consumption uh, effects. Uh, we did look at various things such as. Uh, Newspaper readership, readership of tabloid newspapers, with the broadsheet newspapers, readership of individual newspapers, uh, and we really uh, generally struggle to find any significant impact for uh, media consumption. Um, uh, maybe it's just we didn't have enough cases, maybe it's we weren't looking over the right period of time, maybe we just didn't, didn't, uh, didn't design the variables the right way. Um, but there doesn't seem to be. Um, necessarily impact of specific types of media. The impact seems to be the media overall and the way they, they frame political ethics because the media generally, all the different uh, media outlets tend to uh, look at uh, things that politicians do that are ethically dubious to put emphasis on that. And that seems to be the, the general, uh, general media effect rather than the effect of specific media. Okay. Now, this uh, graph here it comes from our survey data and um, it supports the, the insights we got from our focus groups. It shows if you ask people what types of behaviours are problematic in British politics, they're as likely to emphasise things such as not giving straight answers to questions and making promises they don't, they know they, they're not going to be able to keep, as they are things such as spending their expenses and paying bribes. Paying bribes, um, people were were, were less. <coughs> Uh, grant that, that politicians are likely to uh, do. Although, interestingly, if you look at, if you ask, ask people, you know, how much is, is, how much of a problem is not giving straight answers to questions, how much of a problem is politicians uh, accepting bribes, how much of a problem is um, politicians building their expenses, how much of uh, a problem is uh, making promises they know they can't keep, on all of those questions, even, even the bribery questions, um, there's uh, answers here, which is a, a mean score and a, a 0 to 10 scale, they're all above the midpoint. So even when it comes to paying bribes, most people place politicians above the midpoint on the, the 0 to 10 scale. Uh, so most people in the UK think politicians are pretty dishonest and even 
engage in uh, bribery. Um, and again, thinking, well, why is that? And, and it comes back, I think, to uh, this idea that uh, people take their own personal experience and they extrapolate from that and they see the types of things that politicians do that involve um, uh, you know, a lot of um, uh, doing things without you know, filing for expense claims without completing the relevant documentation and submitting receipts. And that type of thing, I think, looks dodgy to people. Um, or you know, asking questions in Parliament where they have a connection with the organisation uh, that might have an interest in that question. All these types of things that uh, politicians do when they, they exercise a, a very large amount of discretion to most people on their jobs. Uh, and those types of things, I think, are likely to lead people to the conclusion uh, that politicians um, engage in, in rather um, dubious activity, including accepting bribes. And I think it's a, sort of a noteworthy finding. So. Um, Yes, uh, people who are as critical of uh, the abuse of, uh, of words, of discursive lack of integrity as though uh, financial lack of integrity, but there is also uh, a strong, um, people who are strongly cri critical of politicians' uh, abuse of, of resources as well, and I think they're quite dishonest even they think they um, uh, accept right. So, um, right, those are the basic findings. Now, um, we also looked at the impact, of, as, as Paul did, we looked at the impact <coughs> of perceptions of political ethics on political behavior. And we found, and I'm not going to go into the details here, but we found that uh, perceptions of political ethics matter for political participation. This would be participation in, not including voting, but participation in other aspects of the election campaign. Um, we also found that Perceptions of political ethics matter for China. People are more likely to vote if they have uh, a less critical attitude towards politicians. Um, they also make it more likely that people will vote for a major party. If they're more critical of politicians, they're more likely to vote for a minor party. And if people um, are less critical of politicians, they're more likely to comply with the law. So they're more likely to say that they are likely to obey the law if they have a high opinion of politicians. If they low opinion politicians are more likely to say that they um, might disobey the law. So perceptions of political ethics do matter for the political process. Um, all right, so then the million dollar question is uh, what to do. I'll go through this really quickly. Um, this wasn't a major focus of our research, uh, but we did come up with uh, a number of small uh, incremental changes that might be helpful in uh, making the political system work a bit better and, and raising um, perceptions of politicians. But we thought more effective really engagement with political ethics and getting, maybe getting some, some MPs to actually go sit on, on some of these focus groups, like the one we did, so they can actually hear what the way or no talk, talk about them. Um, and uh, some helping politicians make more effective responses to, to the types of views that people have. Um, trying to encourage them to um, exhibit a little bit more discursive integrity, to spin a bit less, um, and to try to think a bit more about popular attitudes and what people how people relate to politicians when designing institutions, um, having more effective sanctions for misconduct, uh, more transparency in certain aspects of the political process, and um, also a bit <coughs> more rigorous and more innovative citizenship education. So that there was more uh, public education of ordinary people. But what the political process is, uh, what the political process in, in the UK involves, I think it's quite telling that uh, the types of television programs we have in the UK are going you know, to have I Got News for You and think of it and so forth. They're quite satirical. They portray politicians in a ne negative light. You don't have Borg or the West or whatever. I think actually trying to get people to understand what the job of politician involves might help them to, to empathise a bit more with politicians. Thank you, sir.